Thanks for watching our sermon videos. And we encourage you to plug into a local church somewhere. Plug into a church near you. See you soon. See you soon. See you soon. I don't know. Is that close enough? Tonight we get to begin our series on angels and demons and spiritual creatures and, and ghosts. We're going to discover over the next quarter exactly what scripture has to say about these. Um, but we are going to make specific application to our lives and we're going to learn something deep about the nature of God. And tonight I want to start everything off by looking at the sovereignty of the God of the universe. Now as we read the book of Job, we need to know a couple of things. Uh, first and foremost, um, Job is is not a book that is written primarily about Job. Um, if we know kind of the storyline, it starts out by saying Job is a person who is righteous before God. In fact, no fault is found in him. He has all this stuff. He is a rich man in the world. Um, and then Satan comes along and God gives Satan permission to sort of take all of these things from Job, uh, including like his children and even giving him bad health. God just gives Satan permission to take these things from Job. And Job, in all of this, he keeps his faith despite every Everybody around him telling him that, Job, you need to just curse God because God has cursed you and you need to go ahead and die. Job keeps his faith to the very end of the book and God rewards him. But the book is not about Job and the book is not about Satan. This book primarily is a book about the sovereignty of God. So in a world where it sure does seem to us like there is a spiritual realm that angels do exist and angels do interact with people on occasion, that demons do exist and that there might be some other uh, spiritual creatures that exist, um, considering God's sovereignty, we have to ask this question, is there a reason whatsoever for us to fear when it comes to spiritual beings or other spiritual creatures in the universe that we are also in. Uh, we hear some scary stories, um, stories of hauntings, stories of possession. And my question tonight is going to be, is there a reason whatsoever that we, the people of God, should fear? What does God's sovereignty mean when we think about spiritual warfare that is taking place in the world? Uh, so, we find ourselves in Job, Job chapter 1. I'm going to start in verse 6 and read through verse 12. Job chapter 1, verses 6 through 12. One day, the sons of God, angels, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord asked Satan, where have you come from? From roaming through the earth, Satan answered him, and walking around it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? No one else on earth is like him, a man of perfect integrity who fears God and turns away from evil. Satan answered the Lord, Does Job fear God for nothing? Haven't you placed a hedge, a hedge of protection around him, his household, and everything he owns? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and strike everything he owns, and he will surely curse you to your face. Very well, the Lord told Satan, everything he owns is in your power. However, you must not lay a hand on Job himself. So Satan left the Lord's presence. Pray with me. God, we want to thank you so much uh, for bringing us here again tonight, for being so willing to, to meet us again in this place as we meet God, we want, to, we want to ask you as we look into this passage of Scripture to speak into our lives, to reveal something to us about yourself that maybe we haven't realized before. God, to help us trust more in your uh, sovereignty, your kingship over the universe. God, convict us where we need to be convicted and encourage us where we need to be encouraged. God, we love you so much and thank you again for every opportunity that you give us to dive in to your word together. We love you. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now as we look into this text of scripture, I want us to notice a couple of things. Um, God being the main character, we know that the story is entirely about 
God and the way that God interacts, uh, first of all, with his angels and with Satan and then with Job. So we're going to look at these things. Uh, This happens uh, during a time when the angels would actually come and present themselves before God. Satan came with the angels and God asked Satan what he has been up to and Satan gave an account of what he had been doing. The very first thing I want us to know as we begin this series on angels and demons and ghosts is that even Satan here in this text is being held accountable to the God of the universe. Satan, this fallen angel who has rebelled against God and roams the earth, is actually having to give an account of his actions to the God of the universe. So as scary as we think Satan might be or as scary the thought of Satan is for the Christian, we have to understand that Satan is still God's Satan. God is still sovereign over over Satan. He is still sovereign over uh, spiritual forces of darkness. God is absolutely sovereign. He does absolutely hold the leash. And we see that even when God looks to Satan and says, have you considered my servant Job? And Satan says, but God, your hedge of protection has been around Job and, and his family and his, and his possessions. Uh, strike, strike him. Take all of this away from him. And God actually gives Satan permission to do those things. What I find is when spiritual forces of darkness, when spiritual forces of darkness want to hurt the people of God specifically in the context of this passage, they actually have to receive permission from the God of the universe. This speaks to God's sovereignty. God is absolutely in control of everything. That we have no reason to fear because God is our God. And we'll see in a few moments that God had a very specific reason for allowing Satan to to do these things that he did. To take everything that he took from Job. God is absolutely sovereign over everything else. He has all power. So we might answer this question from the start. Do we have reason to fear? The answer is simple. No. We don't have anything to fear, nothing nothing that, that is except for, for God. We do have reason to fear the God of the universe. God is the one who holds the leash. God is the one who is in charge. God is the one who is absolutely sovereign. What I learned then is that when the bad stuff happens in my life, First of all, we have to know that it's not always spiritual forces of darkness that are causing these bad things to happen in our lives. But when something bad does happen in my life, uh, whether it is caused by a spiritual force of darkness, by demonic forces, or or by the the armies of Satan, or whether it's just something bad that happens, uh, like like a tornado comes through and just takes everything I have, or a family member member dies, or anything like that, when bad stuff happens to, to me, I know that God, in his sovereignty, has allowed that thing to happen. It wasn't too long ago that we were talking about, uh, you know, not everything happens specifically for a reason, but God can use absolutely everything for a purpose. So if God has allowed something to happen to us, that includes death of family members, that includes loss of our possessions, uh, it includes us being put down or includes us being bullied sometimes it it includes a whole lot of hurtful stuff that can happen in this in this world when God allows that stuff to happen then God has allowed that stuff to happen so that he can use it he doesn't allow something to happen just so he can not use it God God can use everything for a purpose And, and he does that with Job here as we'll learn in just a few just a few moments something else that I that I learn here and in this text of scripture specifically as, as God is interacting with Satan is that when, um, when in my life this terrible stuff, absolutely terrible stuff does happen and God is using these things for a purpose, when this stuff does happen, then I can benefit from it in some way. If God has a purpose for, for these things happening, then in my life, when these things do happen, when they occur, whether they're caused by spiritual forces of darkness or whether they're things that just happen, I can trust that God can use it for a purpose, and that means that there's, there's a response that God calls me to in, in my own life. 
and this is, this is what we learn about Job. Job was a righteous, absolutely righteous man before the Lord. There was no fault found in him according to the book of Job. Yet God allows or gives Satan permission to come against Job and to take everything that he has. What I want to do is skip to the, to the end of the book. Uh, you know, um, in school they actually teach me now to skip to the end of the book. It's kind of awesome. You know, in, uh, in middle school and high school, they, didn't, they said you, have to, you should read the whole book, start with the first word and read every word to the, to the last chapter. No, forget about that. When you get on like the master's level and, and the doctoral level in class, they say, no, read, read the first paragraph and read the last paragraph and then read the first sentence of every paragraph in between and you get the book. Uh, so we're going to skip to the end of Job. Um, Job chapter 42, Job chapter 42, verses 10 and 11. This is after Satan had taken everything from Job. This is after uh, Job's friends said, Job, you need to curse God. This is after Job's own wife said, Job, you need to curse God and you need to die. His friends accused him of being so sinful that God took all of this stuff from him and then caused him to get really, really sick. But Job kept the faith. Kept the faith and learned some things about God on the way. But here is a result of everything that happened. After Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his prosperity, doubled his previous possessions. All his brothers and sisters and former acquaintance, acquaintances came to his house and dined with him in his house. They sympathized with him and comforted him concerning all the adversity the Lord had brought on him. Each one gave him a I don't know how to pronounce this word, casita, and a gold earring. So here we find that these, these friends that Job had before, they, they began coming back to him. After, of course, they came back to him after God is restoring his possessions. God is making Job rich again, and his friends start coming back. Go figure, right? Um, but anyway, the friends start coming back to him. Job does not shun them like like, you know, maybe we would or maybe we think he should. He doesn't uh, tell them that they have no place with him anymore, that they weren't true friends. Instead, he, he prays for them and he celebrates with them in his possessions and he shares those possessions uh, with him. There's a change that we see in Job from, from the first chapter to the last. And maybe there was no fault found in him, but just because there was no fault found in him that he was righteous before God uh, doesn't mean that he still didn't have growing to do. And so God in giving permission to, to Satan to take everything that Job had and even to make Job sick later on in the middle of, of the book of Job, God had a very different purpose than Satan had. Satan had, had this purpose in mind. God, I am going to prove that you don't know it all. Of course Job has faith in you, God. You've given him a hedge of protection. Give me permission. Give me permission to go and take everything he has. He'll curse you. He'll turn against you. Satan was going to prove that God was fallible and that God was wrong. Of course, God, we know, he's already won the fight. We tend to think of spiritual warfare in this sense that there's some cosmic struggle going on between God and and Satan and and they're battling each other. No, God is in charge. God has always been in charge. God always will be in charge. There's no chance whatsoever that Satan has. I don't know if Satan thinks he has a chance or if he just does these things to sort of spite God. I don't don't know the answer to that. But what we see is that while while Satan had this sort of vindictive attitude, while, while Satan's agenda was to spite God or try and take one of God's people away from God, God had a very different agenda. God's agenda was not to prove Satan wrong. If his agenda was purely and only to prove Satan wrong, then he would have been being pretty mean to Job, I think. No, God's attention was on Job this entire time. God's love and his care was on Job this entire time. The Job in chapter 1 maybe wouldn't have prayed for his own friends and accepted his friends back to him. But Job, after losing everything, came to a place where he had to 
pay attention to what God had to say. Eventually, Job did question God and say, God, why are you letting all this happen? He didn't lose his faith, but he did question God. And God responded by, by saying, who, who are you to question the creator of the universe? Uh, did you make the human mouth? Uh, did, you, did you form the mountains? Did you form the seas? Did you create all of this? No. Are you the one who blessed you with all of the material possessions? That you, no. God had to, had to humble Job so that Job could grow more mature in the faith. This is true for a lot of us, isn't it? We grow so comfortable in the, in the things that we have and what we, what we think we know, the knowledge that we have obtained, the positions that we have. And God takes some opportunities to humble us. This is the opportunity he took with Job to take from us so that we have to focus on on him. And when God takes from us, we have the opportunity to grow much more mature in the faith than we than we were before just like Job did. In chapter 42, we see we see a Job who who is praying for those friends who who left him, who told him to curse God and to die. Who said, "Job, it's because of the sin in your own life that God is punishing you. That's the only reason God punishes people. The reality is God wasn't punishing Job. God had granted Satan permission to take things from Job for the specific purpose of Job's own sanctification. Here's what I learned about, about God in this entire entire book. God cares much more about our sanctification than about the belongings that we have. God cares much more about our sanctification than about the belongings that we have. God cares much more about our growing more mature in the faith in Him, in service to Him, and in in love to Him than He does even about us having the people in our lives. If we follow God and it costs us everybody we know, God says in this book of Scripture, it is worth it. Absolutely worth it. If we have to leave everything that we are comfortable with to follow God, it is worth it. Now the difference between Job and us is God restored his possessions materialistically. In fact, he gave Job much more or many more material possessions than he had before. God doesn't do this with everybody. He did this with Job. He does not do this with everybody. What he does promise us, though, is amazing. He does promise some sort of reward. He does promise that, um, and this is in the Gospel of Mark, that those who leave fathers or mothers or houses or lands for the sake of the Gospel, for the sake of following Christ, they will receive tenfold of what they gave up in the eternal age. So there is a reward waiting for us for the things that we give up for the sake of Christ. It's not like God allows things to be taken from us or even sometimes himself does take things from us for no reason. God always has a purpose for everything that he does. And So as we begin this, this series, angels and, and demons and, and ghosts or maybe other spiritual creatures that we might learn about within the text of Scripture, we know this, first and foremost, starting out, is that God is is absolutely in control. God is king over everything. You know, there's a fear that sometimes uh, dumbfounds us when it, when, it comes to, when it comes to spiritual creatures or ghosts or, or demons or things like that, a fear that causes our, our Catholic friends to pray to angels and to worship angels, a, a fear that, that causes us to be so fascinated with TV shows like Ghost Adventures, and I'll, I'll admit I like watching that show, but I don't believe everything that I see in that show. That would be kind of kind of silly to believe everything I see in that show, but it causes us to be fascinated with those things. Um, there is a such a, a fear um, that comes over us or a fascination that comes over us as an American culture that more and more um, Americans are trying to communicate with lost loved ones. And as much as I would love to communicate with lost loved ones, um, I, I think there are there are very dangerous ways that people go about trying to trying to do that. What we know first and foremost is that our faith is not in the angels. Our fear is not of the demons. 
our fascination instead is wholly, completely, and entirely in God. In the person of Jesus Christ. We worship God. We pray to God. We fear God and nothing else. And if God in his sovereignty chooses to allow some creature in the spiritual realm to take from us or to bother us in in some manner, in some degree, then we know that God is using that specifically for our sanctification. Specifically for our sanctification. So I guess the, the challenge tonight, the challenge for our lives is going to be this. And no matter what we, we hear from, from television or, or read, in the, read in the newspaper, or no matter what we feel like is happening, if we've had a spiritual experience that, that seems kind of odd, and maybe it's one of those spiritual experiences that we're like, I don't really want to share this because people are going to think I'm, I'm a little bit off, a little bit weird. Um, we know this first and foremost. We don't always interpret things the right way. We don't always interpret our experiences the right way. The same is true with, with people on, on popular TV shows. They don't always interpret reality, interpret experiences the, the right way. We believe in a God that has given us the, the information that he believes that we need. And if, if this is the information that God believes that we need, then, then this is the information that we ought to operate by. The very word of God. And so we look to the scriptures to interpret our experiences. This is the challenge for our lives. When we hear those things in popular culture, we go to Scripture first. And when others are drawn to worship things other than God, whether that's angels or demons or other gods or idols or material possessions or entertainment, any number of things, we hold steadfast to the way of truth, to our worship of the God of the universe. And we trust God. We trust him to provide all of the information that we need. That, that is the challenge. And it is also an encouragement to us. Because if we have the right information available to us, then there are not, you know, many other, in fact, there are not any other places that we need to look for that information.